Gresham College presents Decolonization: The End of Empire by Professor Richard J. Evans, FBA. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, this evening, in the last of this year's series of uh, Gresham uh, rhetoric lectures, as they're called, in fact, history lectures this time around, um, series on empire, I want to ask why the European global empires collapsed so suddenly in the 30 short years from 1945 to 1975. The collapse of the European empires is easy enough to relate. Uh, here you see uh, uh, a map uh, of, the, of the empires and which uh, countries belong to them. Uh, but it's rather harder to explain. Uh, by, by the end of the 1930s, the European empires had actually reached their largest extent the end of the First World War had seen the parceling out of Turkish possessions in the Middle East, giving Syria and Lebanon to France, Palestine, Transjordan and Iraq to Britain, part of Somalia to Italy, ratified by the Turks in 1923 at the Treaty of Lausanne. In the 1930s, <coughs> Italy acquired Ethiopia, though not in a manner that met with the approval of the international community. Only Germany had been excluded from the Imperial Club. But within three decades of the end of the Second World War, almost all of this had gone. In 1945, as a losing power, Italy was deprived of its colonies like Germany had been in 1918 to 19. Ethiopia became independent again. But whereas uh, this had been the general pattern at the end of the First World War with the losing powers, particularly Germany and the Ottoman Empire uh, losing their uh, colonies and colonies gobbled up by the victors, in a sense. In the aftermath of the Second World War, it was mainly the victors who lost their colonial empires. <clears throat> and this is a global process, affecting all the European empires, every part of the world. It began in Asia, and in particular, in the countries occupied by the Japanese during the war. Uh, in uh, the, um, uh, after conquest and occupation, the Japanese began by incorporating European colonies into their own empire. They harshly uh, repressed any attempt at resistance. But when things started going badly, they tried to encourage nationalist uprisings against the European colonial powers in the territories they'd not occupied or which were threatened by Britain and the USA. By declaring the occupied territories independent, Burma and the Philippines, 1943, Indonesia, 1944. And these areas, of course, this is recognized as Japanese Declaration of Independence was recognized as a sham, but still, the Japanese ousting of the colonial power destroyed its legitimacy. It demonstrated Asians could defeat Europeans. It stimulated nationalist resistance movements anyway. 1948, the British agreed to Burmese independence, not least because the function of Burma as a buffer state to the east of India now disappeared. I'll come back to that in a minute. The Philippines, the Americans had already announced the intention of granting independence in 1935. The Japanese invasion merely delayed the event until 1945. The Dutch in Europe, as <coughs> here you can see from this poster, urged Dutch men to sign up to free the Dutch East Indies from Japanese control, meaning to get them back under Dutch rule. This is India has got to be free. The Dutch East Indies had to be free means free means back under Dutch control. But Indonesian nationalists led by Sukarno declared independence and after a lengthy and bitter war costing the lives of more than 20,000 Europeans and many more Indonesians, international pressure forced the Dutch to withdraw and recognize Indonesian independence in 1949. In French Indochina, also conquered by the Japanese, situations similar. French rule began to disintegrate as the Kingdom of Siam, Thailand, which had managed to remain independent by playing off the British and Burma to the west against the French in Cambodia and Vietnam to the east, persuaded the French to return some territory to it in 1938 and then invaded French Indochina in 1940 to conquer some more. The Japanese, however, invaded Thailand later in the year, winning over the Thais with promises of further territorial gains. And when the Japanese were defeated, the Thais uh, retained their independence by aligning themselves with the Americans as a bulwark against the communist threat 
from China and the Soviet Union. Whatever the ins and outs of sometimes convoluted political maneuverings in the region, everywhere Japanese conquest also cut off European colonies from the colonial metropoles for several years during the war. And this enabled resistance movements to emerge focused on independence rather than reconnection with the imperial power, as might have happened had these colonies been full of large numbers of European settlers, which they were not. Um, there's an obvious parallel, parallel here to, uh, which will occur to those of you who've stayed the course and remember the first lecture in the series, parallel to the impact of the Napoleonic Wars, which cut off Spanish colonies in the Americas from Spain for years on end. In French Indochina itself, the um, Japanese, the Japanese Empire here, were discredited as a result of a widespread famine in 1944 to 5, in which between 1 and 2 million out of a population of around 10 million died of starvation and related malnutrition related diseases. The communist resistance under Ho Chi Minh found a member of the French Communist Party during his years in Paris in the early 1920s, gained support by encouraging people to mount raids on food stores. After the end of the war, elections were held in 1946, giving the communists victory in central and northern Vietnam. But the French refused to accept this, and as the Cold War began, armed conflict also began, lost by the French, in 1944 as the, at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Here you can see the French uh, Indochina, the sequence of uh, independence, uh, uh, the sequence of, of acquisitions here by the, by the French. There's the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the beleaguered French garrison um, under heavy fire uh, and uh, eventually had to surrender. It's already a rearguard action. Conflicts have broken out all over Indo Indo Indochina forcing the French to start withdrawing already in 1953. In neighboring Cambodia, uh, the royal family had uh, survived under French rule and declared independence at the request of the Japanese towards the end of the war, part of this Japanese policy again. Although the French reimposed control, the disintegration of their Indo-Chinese empire led to negotiated independence for Cambodia, Cambodge, in 1953. And in Laos, the same process took place. Japanese conquest followed by declaration of independence, French reoccupation, French withdrawal in 1953. So all over this region then, the Japanese invasion gave the impetus to independence movements that already existed but previously didn't have much influence. The sight of Europeans uh, arrested, interned, and maltreated by the Japanese as this illustration of an internment camp in the Dutch East Indies uh, shows uh, destroyed any lingering sense of deference to them or sense of European superiority. Looming large over all these processes and encouraging nationalists all over Southeast Asia was independence for India, achieved in 1947. I described in the previous lecture in February how the conditions that had enabled Britain to acquire and rule the vast Indian subcontinent with its huge population and resources, how these conditions were coming to an end after 1918. <coughs> In particular, a new educated Indian elite began agitating first for self-governing dominion status along the same lines as Canada or Australia and New Zealand, and then for independence. British concessions were made in the form of elected legislatures, but in a sort of fatal combination, they were counterbalanced by repressive measures, the continuation of wartime emergency powers after 1918, and the mowing down of a peaceful protest by troops under the command of General Reginald Dyer, Adam Ritzar, in 1918, in which some 380 Indians were killed and more than a thousand wounded. This immediately entered the uh, iconography, uh, mythology, if you like, of uh, the Indian independence movement. It's a, a, a vital event. Dyer had ordered, ordered public floggings of Indians after a number of Europeans had been murdered 
uh, in the city of Amritsar, and a white woman missionary had been assaulted. And uh, his tensions were considerably exacerbated by his so-called crawling order, which made Indians crawl on all fours at the site of the assault. Dyer was censured and dismissed, but not prosecuted. And the incident did a lot to discredit British rule. In the 1920s and 1930s, the civil disobedience campaign led by Mahatma Gandhi frequently spilled over into demonstrations, riots, and violence, met by the British authorities with repression. And as economic problems spread, so the educated elites' campaigns gained more popular support. The Government of India Act of 1935 extended the electorate to 30 million people. Seems a lot, it's still a small proportion of the population. It gave more rights to legislatures. And it led to a sweeping electoral victory for the Indian National Congress in 1937. Yet, the limits of Indian influence were graphically underlined in 1939 when the British government declared war on behalf of India without any consultation in India itself. Congress leaders <coughs> resigned their government post in protest and were arrested. And at the end of the war, when they were released, events were rapidly spinning out of British control. British cartoonists ridiculed Gandhi's uh, policy of non-violence during the war, there are the uh, Japanese coming in their tanks from Burma. Uh, but in fact, it had led to major changes, perhaps accelerated by the implicit threat of violence should it fail. Well, I said events were beginning to escape the grasp of the British in India, but two problems now um, accelerated matters onto their climax. First of all, the globalization of food supplies within the British Empire now turned against it. In the absence of rationing or price control, such as been imposed in the UK, rising demand, fueled by the need to buy up supplies for British troops, fueled inflation, which soon put many foodstuffs out of the reach of the poor in many parts of the empire. Food supplies were also cut off by wartime activity. And worst of all was the situation in Bengal. The complacent and inefficient colonial administration in India did nothing to curb inflation, speculation and hoarding, even when Burma fell, which deprived the subcontinent of 15% of its rice supply to come from Burma. The provincial governments in India reacted by banning the export of food to other provinces, strangling the machinery of trade in food in what one food controller called an outbreak of insane provincial protectionism. On top of this, the winter rice harvest of 1942 failed because of a fungal disease that spread rapidly <coughs> in an unusually warm and humid spell of weather. No measures were taken to impose rationing or force hoarders to disgorge supplies for fear of provoking political dissent. Churchill ordered a 60% cut in civil and military shipping to the Indian Ocean, commenting that Indians should not take food supplies that could be used by the mother country. For him, as for the cartoonist Illingworth, it showed that the Indians were incapable of governing themselves and that Congress's sympathizers in Britain and the USA were unrealistic idealists <clears throat> who failed to recognize that the colonial power was all that stood between India and ruin. As many as three, me, three million people may have died from starvation and diseases such as cholera associated with the movements of large numbers of people across the country in search of food and famine relief. <clears throat> the government imposed strict censorship to stop news of the famine spreading. It was only when Viscount Wavell was appointed Vice, Viceroy of India in September 1943 worried about morale among Indian troops uh, who uh, were charged with the mission to recapture Burma from the Japanese, it's only at that point that decisive action was taken. And even so, Wavell had to overcome considerable resistance from Churchill and the government in London. And the famine again seriously undermined 
popular support in India for the British Raj. The cartoon suggested that the British uh, were capable of, uh, of uh, dealing with the famine, but reality seemed to show otherwise. And then secondly, the British should encourage Hindu-Muslim rivalry in order to weaken the Indian nationalist movement. So <clears throat> the mainly Hindu nationalism of the Indian National Congress was meant to be counterbalanced by the All India Muslim League, founded in 1906 on British initiative. By 1945, suspicions between the two religious communities had deepened to such an extent that pressure at both extremes was beginning to overwhelm Gandhi's attempts to keep the nation together and lead it into independence as a united unitary state. The Muslim leader Jinnah rejected Congress leader Nehru's offer of five seats in an all India government complaining of Hindu oppression uh, of Muslims. Here's another uh, cartoon, this time by, by Lowe. Violent incidents meshed with growing political tensions between Congress and the Muslim League to force the British government's hand as civil war seemed to loom alongside famine while the politicians dithered, bickered and drew up elaborate plans from a distance. Here you have them all uh, up, a, up a tree uh, while uh, the spectres uh, of the tiger of civil war and the jackal of famine are threatening the Indian population, symbolised here by a mother and a baby. Partition between a Hindu-dominated India and a Muslim Pakistan, uh, divided between the northeast and northwest, was agreed. The princely states, you remember, retained their autonomy, were left free to choose their allegiance, as the British abandoned their claim to suzerainty over them. And in June 1947, the last viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, announced independence for August before the lines of demarcation had been finally drawn, leaving areas like Kashmir still in dispute. So the uh, British scampered out of India very hurriedly, having lost control of the situation almost completely, uh, and feeling that they simply had to, had to go, leaving many problems unresolved. And although there were safeguards, uh, supposed to be safeguards for minorities, uh, those um, Hindus left in Pakistan and the Muslims left in India, a huge tidal wave of violence overwhelmed the new states as massacres of religious minorities killed between half a million and a million people and seven and a quarter million terrified refugees fled in either direction. The collapse of the British, Dutch and French rule in Asia was the first stage in the collapse of the European empires on a global scale. Japanese conquest and encouragement of nationalist movements, however insincere, had been a, a serious, significant trigger. Unlike colonies with a significant European population like Canada, or Australia or New Zealand, European rule in Asian and African colonies remained ultimately based on force and was never wholly accepted by the colonized. Traditional political structures in the colonies had been destroyed or adapted or co-opted by the colonial powers, the processes I've described in previous lectures, depending on the circumstances. But the resistance that eventually destroyed colonial rule seldom came from this direction. Strong and surviving indigenous religious or cultural traditions, such as Islam in North and West Africa, Malaya in Indonesia, or Buddhism in Indochina, or Hinduism in India, could provide a basis for continued resistance. But this required political mobilization as well. And in the end, this had to come from new ideologies and forms of political organization imported from Europe, sometimes grafted onto indigenous uh, traditions and beliefs, but still uh, in new ideologies, all the same. Now, described in previous uh, lectures, the system of indirect rule, the support of collaborating elites and colonized societies, which meant maintaining 
hierarchical and undemocratic political structures. But alongside the uh, traditional elites with whom European colonizing powers often uh, cooperated in running the colonies, it's also necessary to train up new elites educated in the colonizers' language, English, French, or Dutch, to act as modern administrators. And this education, even if it began in mission schools, was very often taken to an advanced level in the colonial metropolis. There are many, many examples of this. A typical example uh, was Hastings Banda, who studied medicine in Edinburgh and read history at the University of Chicago before returning home to Nyasaland to lead the country to independence uh, as Malawi. And it's not surprising that uh, many nationalist and communist leaders in the colonies began their political careers by joining political groups in London, Paris, or wherever they were studying, and then taking new political ideas back home. Ho Chi Minh, the Vietnamese communist leader who joined the Communist Party in Paris on its foundation in the early 1920s, is a classical example of this. Here he is working in a Paris restaurant in 19. 19 before he grew his famous little goatee beard. These beliefs that these later nationalist or communist or combination of the two uh, leaders in the uh, colonies, you know, these beliefs that they imbibed in the metropolis didn't have to be extreme ideas. Even a moderate belief in equality before the law, for example, would be bound to run up against the existence of different legal systems for Europeans and non-Europeans in the colonies. Or a com commonplace European liberal belief in elections and parliamentary sovereignty would be bound to run up against the absence of these things in the colonies. Above all, from 1918 onwards, the principle of national self-determination, the idea that each nation should have the right to determine its own destiny, uh, swept all before it in the peace settlement of 1919 dominant in Europe through to the end of the Second World War and beyond, though more often violated in practice than maintained, but still as an ideal it was there and it was utterly confounded by the experience of colonial rule. Now, of course, the concept of a nation was problematical, to say the least, <clears throat> in huge conglomerates of widely differing geographical, climatic zones, political, social systems, religious affiliations like, say, Nigeria. But European education helped create new, modernizing elites who were able to push aside traditional collaborating elites, unite the colonized in opposition to European racism and colonial domination, and argue powerfully for a greater say in the government of whichever colony they happen to, to live in. Economic development accelerated these processes as denser, faster communications from the railway to uh, the airplane to the telephone helped uh, unite uh, uh, disparate tribes, communities, and regions and groups across wide areas. It's just the one example of the Indian railway map in 1909. You can repeat this in, in other colonies too. Railways, roads, telephones, uh, later on, of course, air, um, um, air communications. All of this made it easier for nationalist movements to uh, create a kind of united movement across a large area. Urbanization, the growth of uh, modern capitalism, industry, <coughs> not only led to the rapid growth of new indigenous economic and professional elites in many colonies, they also created impoverished urban masses ready to listen to the nationalist message as a way out of their oppression. And it was in India, perhaps, that all these processes were at their most advanced, since they'd been in train for the longest period of time and could build on powerful indigenous religious and cultural traditions. India frequently acted as a model for other colonies. And within the British Empire, the emergence of self-governing dominions provided another model it was followed by the national movement in India and then other colonies too. And for the British themselves, <coughs> the evolution of self-governing dominions also provided a model to follow, provided, provided they conceded 
British conceded the fitness of a colony to govern itself. And something that they did with only extreme reluctance in India and Africa, since those demanding self-government, of course, uh, unlike those in, say, New Zealand or Australia, Canada were not Europeans. The legitimacy of imperialism had been undermined in the First World War, but the new idealistic atmosphere of international relations after 1918 still left European powers convinced they could control the pace and the nature of the slow emergence of structures of self-governance in the colonies. In any case, up to the Second World War, nationalist and anti-colonialist movements generally grew only relatively slowly and had, except perhaps in India and Ceylon, relatively little impact. It was, again, the, the war itself that made the crucial difference. Uh, European powers retained control over African colonies through the war, but knowledge of European defeats in the Far East and indeed in Europe itself, encouraged nationalist movements. The barbarous and genocidal behavior of the Germans in Eastern Europe, their exploitation of an enormous area of Europe more generally, severely damaged the le moral legitimacy of empire itself. This is an empire, so Germans call it a Reich, which means an empire. Um, the way they exploited uh, particularly East Central and Eastern Europe uh, with massive uh, starvation, famine, mass murders and so on uh, appeared worldwide uh, as a severe blow to the moral legitimacy of the idea of one country controlling another. And within Britain, France and other countries in Europe, critics of empire increased in number and persuasiveness as a consequence. And Nazi racism largely destroyed the legitimacy of racism in Europe itself. The Nazis had made this into a dogma of superiority of what they call the Aryan race, meaning basically Germans and perhaps Scandinavians over all others, um, and using that to le legitimize mass murder of uh, Slavs, above all of Jews and other groups. And uh, the experience of the horrors of Nazi racism undermined the claim of Europeans to be morally superior to Africans or Asians. Again, undermined the, the moral basis of the legitimacy of colonialism. Conversely, of course, many colonies also made a major contribution to the war effort of the British and their allies in fighting the Japanese and the Nazis. And this, too, increased the legitimacy of demands for self-government after the fighting stopped. We have fought for you, now please give us uh, more power over our own destiny. And then above all, and this impact of the war, because the war brought two superpowers, the USA and the USSR, to prominence. Uh, these uh, dominated the world after the end of the Second World War and, uh, of course, uh, began to uh, fight each other, at least uh, not in a kind of hot war, but in the famous Cold War. One of the few things they had in common was opposition to colonialism. And the emergence of the Cold War uh, between the two superpowers symbolized in this cartoon created a competition for the support of what came to be known as third world countries. Liberation movements were often backed by the Soviet Union and the USA and the West more generally sought to defuse them by making concessions to demands for independence or putting pressure on the colonial powers to do so. <clears throat> in other words, if you don't grant independence, you may find that the communists will step in uh, and take over the country when it does become independent. Only where European countries seem to be a firm bulwark against communism did Americans, uh, a European colony seemed to be a firm bulwark against communism did the Americans support continuation of colonial rule, and it's not many examples. Now, it's sometimes said that the British economy was exhausted, even bankrupted, by fighting the Second World War. 
And so Britain was unable to devote resources to retaining its colonial empire. But in fact, the British uh, economy was extremely strong uh, during the Second World War. There, were, there was a crisis after the, after the war, but uh, it, that you can't, as it were, say simply didn't have the money to run an empire anymore. It's much more complicated than that. But basically, the British economy became <clears throat> more dependent on the much larger and more affluent US economy when sterling was made fully convertible with the American dollar as a condition of wartime and post-war loans. Previously, sterling earnings could only be spent in sterling countries. Britain's reaction to this opening up of world markets was to require colonial currencies to maintain fixed exchange rates with sterling, sell their currency earnings to the UK in return for sterling and allow free transfers of sterling. But in 1949, again, when the British government devalued sterling, it did not consult the colonies who were actually bound into this whole structure, again, creating more uh, alienation. Britain believed that the wealth of the colonies could help the British economy, and this led to more vigorous exploitation of plantations, mines, and other colonial resources. And all of this also had damaging and sometimes inflationary effects on colonial economies, helped uh, win support for colonial nationalism. If we can control our own economy, we won't be subjected to this kind of inflationary pressure and exploitation. As the empire became more difficult and more expensive to control, British politicians also wondered increasingly whether it was worth it at a time when more and more money was being spent on the creation of the welfare state at home began to become a, something of a choice. But also, of course, the violence with which colonial powers often confronted movements of national liberation, I've already mentioned some examples, fueled growing protests and opposition to colonialism among liberals and socialists at home. Many were appalled, for example, by the forcible relocation of half a million Malayans to so-called model villages in the Malayan emergency war against communist guerrillas, uh, people who'd originally been armed by the British to fight against the Japanese. Uh, all the way, this, this war went on all the way from uh, 1948 all the way up to 1960, some uh, British troops going through a Malayan village. Uh, it's an enormously expensive operation. And one action alone, Operation Nassau, carried out in December 1954, January 1955, 60,000 artillery shells were fired, 30,000 rounds of mortar ammunition, 2,000 aircraft bombs were dropped, but only 35 terrorists were killed or captured. Each one of them represented, it's been calculated, 1,500 man days of patrolling or waiting in ambushes. These operations the Malayan emergency succeeded because the insurgents were very few in number, about 8,000 altogether, it's thought. And they didn't have an awful lot of support among the population. But still, um, in order to uh, undermine the insurgents' claim to be a movement of national liberation rather than a movement of communist revolution, the British rapidly introduced measures of self-government, so were pulled the rug from underneath them, ending in 1957 with full independence, followed by an end to the emergency three years later. As an example here of the other d dynamic of trying to defuse communist uh, oriented resistance movements by granting national independence. In other parts of the world too, violent opposition created almost insurmountable problems of control. British control in Palestine became shaky when the mass migration of many Jews from Europe after the war led to demands for the fulfillment of the Balfour Declaration of 1917 when the British government had promised the Jews a homeland. Britain was caught between the feeling that this promise should be honoured and its reliance on Arab states for oil supplies alongside its continued role in areas like Iraq at a time when Arab nationalism too is becoming more vocal. Increasingly violent action by extreme Zionist terrorist groups, including the bombing of the British Palestine headquarters at the King David uh, 
Hotel in Jerusalem was paralleled by growing violence between Jews and Arabs. Unable to control this rapidly spiralling violence, Britain resigned its mandate in 1947 when the United Nations recommended separate Arab and Jewish states, leading to full-scale war and the declaration of Israeli independence in May 1948. So it's another example where it's not actually economic resources, it's simple that, that, that lead the British to pull out, it's simply an inability to control uh, a situation that just, uh, is just spiraling completely out of control. And British opinion uh, was divided uh, over events in Palestine. Uh, it was divided over violence elsewhere. Each of these attempts to repress nationalist uprisings encountered severe criticism at home. The repression of the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya from 1952 to 1956, uh, for example, with mass arrests, here's uh, a mass arrest of large numbers of allegedly Mau Mau men, 10,000 African deaths, many executions, aroused criticism in the UK. While in France, the divisions opened up by the Algerian War of Independence from 1954 onwards, marked by torture, assassination on both sides, uh, were uh, so deep, largely because of the fact that the northern provinces are part of France, and there's large numbers of French colonists settled there, uh, so deep they led to the overthrow of the Fourth Republic. In a coup d'etat by General de Gaulle in 1958, founding the Fifth Republic, still with us today, um, followed much of the dismay of his backers who'd hoped that he would assert, reassert control over Algeria, followed by Algerian independence in 1962, as de Gaulle came to recognize that France too could not control the situation. Well, by this time, the uh, end of the 50s, the late 50s, much of the rationale for the retention of colonies by European powers had more or less disappeared. British control over East Africa had been motivated not least by the desire to protect the sea route to India following the opening of the Suez Canal. And now India was independent, it's no longer of much importance. Britain, France and the other colonial powers did not in fact believe in the immediate post-war years that African colonies were ready for independence. Initially, at least, liberation movements were less strong than they were in Asia. European policy in the Middle East and North Africa, mostly, in other words, in former provinces of the Ottoman Empire, had largely rested on indirect control through client rulers of one sort and another. Now, the British protectorate over Egypt, previously effectively an independent state, or autonomous state, was established in 1882, as I described in a previous lecture, but resistance to British rule had been more or less continuous. With the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the proclamation of national self-determination at the Peace Conference in Paris in 1919, this um, resistance had reached new heights, with mass demonstrations in which Egyptian women, for the first time, played a prominent part. British attempts to suppress colonial, anti-colonial riots in Egypt failed despite, once more, the extensive use of violence in some, which some 800 Egyptians were killed. In 1922, Egypt therefore became an independent kingdom. But the Suez Canal remained under control of the British and French-owned and protected Suez Canal Company. And the British continued to control the monarchy from behind the scenes. But the monarchy lost legitimacy as a result largely of its complete incompetence in the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, which many Egyptian elites found humiliating. It was overthrown in 1952 by the pan-Arab nationalist Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser, who declared a republic and nationalized the Suez Canal. And there followed an ill-advised Anglo-French invasion backed with military force by Israel and prompted not least by British Prime Minister Eden's belief that appeasement of Nasser, who had wide-ranging ambitions to lead the Arab world, was no better than appeasement uh, of, of Hitler. It was successful militarily 
the operation uh, largely succeeded. The canal area was recaptured. But it failed politically because of the joint action of the USA and the USSR acting through the United Nations. Among other things, two superpowers uh, were keen not to have to deal with a Middle Eastern powder keg at a time when they were focusing, focusing their attention on the uh, events in East Central Europe, in particular the Soviet suppression of a liberal uprising in Hungary. And the invasion also opened up deep divisions in British politics. Eden was conscious throughout that British public opinion was not fully behind him. So the British and French withdrew, followed somewhat later by the Israelis. The canal remained nationalized, and the result was complete humiliation for the imperialist powers. Other parts of the former Ottoman Empire had gained independence after the First World War, but remained under Anglo-French control behind the scenes, re-established during the Second World War. Libya, under Anglo-French control since its capture from the Italians during the war, had already become independent again in 1951 under the usual conditions of a monarchy uh, subservient to Western interests. The Lebanon grasped independence in 1943 when Vichy France was occupied by the Germans, French colony, French mandate. Events in other former Ottoman provinces like Iraq and Syria took a similar course with the Allies withdrawing again after the end of the Second World War. Morocco, normally un under the uh, rule of a sultan, but actually under Franco-Spanish control, nationalist uprisings in the 20s sparked a violent repression by the colonial powers, leading to the Rif War, an ultimate victory for the Spanish legion legionaries, uh, seen here a rather defensive position, but they did actually win, and then used Morocco as the basis for the invasion of Spain in the 1936 uh, attempted coup uh, uh, against the um, left-wing government, which started off the uh, Spanish Civil War. But still, the examples of Libya, Algeria, and Egypt led to renewal of nationalism in Morocco in the 50s. Independence was ceded in 1956. Tunisia became independent the same years. Uh, and the Suez Crisis had one consequence, which is that the, the British were forced to leave the Sudan as well. So in all the Arab states, the Suez Crisis prov provoked political upheavals. But it's further south in Africa that it had its greatest effect. Again, by undermining the legitimacy and demonstrating the weakness of the grasp of the British and the French. A characteristic example might be in the Gold Coast, now known as Ghana. In 1948, the British shot live rounds at a demonstration of African ex servicemen in Accra, particularly shocking, uh, killing or injuring 68. So even the fact they'd fought for the British didn't make any difference. And they followed this with the arrest of political leaders of the independence movement, including the American-educated Kwame Nkrumah. Leading a movement explicitly based on educated middle-class Africans, Nkrumah exploited the collapse of British legitimacy, emphasized his moderation, and led a series of strikes and demonstrations that forced the British to introduce elections. He duly became prime minister led the country to independence in 1957. And this is the, the first state artificially created during the scramble for Africa to become independent. It starts the, the avalanche, as it were, and others followed rapidly. 13 French colonies gained sovereignty or independence in 1958 to 60. Belgium, Congo, Nigeria, British and Italian Somaliland, 1960. Other British African states, 61 to 63. As a small number of colonies remained, mostly islands or territories thought too small to be viable on their own. Problematic colonies or ex-colonies with a powerful white settler presence like Rhodesia, later Zimbabwe, or South Africa continued to cause problems for a while and occupied what some thought was a disproportionate place in British political debate during the Wilson government in the late 1960s. As Harold Wilson uh, putting in his diary, nothing but uh, uh, talks about Rhodesia. Um, George Brown <coughs> asking him if he'd mind thinking about, uh, about Britain. Portugal held on to its empire till the costs 
both political and economic, became too great, led to a revolution in 1974, overthrowing the long-term fascist dictatorship and freeing the colonies. Spain followed a similar, more peaceful transition after the death of Franco. Finally, in a kind of coda or postscript to all this, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, its colonies on the Baltic coast, East Central Asia, the Caucasus, uh, and I explained in previous uh, lectures why I think it's right to regard these as colonies, uh, and its satellite states in Eastern Europe broke away from Soviet control. The former colonial powers, notably the British and the French, retained loose associations of their former colonies, like the Commonwealth, but these are based more on historic <coughs> ties than on present-day realities, <coughs> designed perhaps uh, to continue the <coughs> illusion in Britain and France um, that they're still global powers. By the 1960s, Western Europe was more concerned really with building peace and prosperity through what became the European Union than with continuing with the increasingly difficult task of maintaining global empires in the face of mounting demands for independence in the colonies. They began to prioritize economic improvement and prosperity at home. They could not deflect the hostility of the USSA, uh, USS, USA and the USSR to the colonial enterprise, as both competed for the allegiance of soon to be independent or newly self-governing parts of Asia and Africa. In fact, you could argue <coughs> it's only by ridding themselves of their overseas empires that European powers are able to devote more resources to prosperity at home, and that, of course, is what wins elections. It wasn't lost on observers that the outstanding post-war economic successes, Germany and Japan, were unencumbered with colonial burdens, while prosperity didn't come to Portugal to the end of empire in the 70s. Of course, the end of empire more generally did not necessarily mean the end of European influence, whether political or economic. French uh, political intervention in former colonies continued. Here's a, a map of some French interventions in former colonies in, in, uh, in Africa. Formal, former colonial powers were often on the inside track for new investments in the ex-colonies to a degree that enabled them in some cases, to exploit what came to be known as third world economies even more effectively than before. Some have argued decolonization can be seen best as a transition from formal to informal colonial control of a sort that, say, Britain had exercised in the 19th century in Latin America. Still, I think that may be taking it too far. Decolonization did, after all, mean the end of European political control, possession and domination. And as such, it meant the end of an era of history that had begun nearly half a millennium before with the Spanish conquest of the Americas in the 1490s and 1500s. So let me try and sum up. Decolonization is a complex and uneven process, difficult to reduce to a few simple formulae, but it's clear that the causes have to be sought both in Europe and in the colonized parts of the world. And Europe itself... The empire, age of empire in the 19th century, was based on the maintenance of peace on the continent. As European powers, except for very brief and partial conflicts, did not become embroiled in any majors with major wars of one another between the end of the, the Napoleonic Wars <coughs> in 1815 and the outbreak of the First World War just under a century later in 1914. Soon as they did become embroiled in conflicts, with one another on a big scale, 1914 and again in 1939, the foundations of empire began to crumble. <clears throat> the belief that the, uh, the First World War had to lead to a better world in order to justify all the suffering and death that it caused led also to a belief that colonialism should not be about exploitation or domination, but about trusteeship. And this idea was underpinned by the mandating of the German colonies to, and Ottoman colonies to various European powers by the League of Nations, based in the German case on the claim that German colonialism had been brutal and violent, so other countries like Britain and France, uh, who uh, took over the mandates, were not only regarded as being capable of ruling more humanely, but actually also were in some ways obliged to do so, or they would run into trouble. <coughs> 
And this notion um, uh, originated not least in uh, outrage. Th these are the mandates at the, en at the end of the First World War. Um, and this notion uh, of uh, trusteeship, of acting responsibly, of course, originated not least in outrage that I described in a previous lecture over Belgian misrule in the Congo. It was reinforced, as I said, by further outrage over the Italian conquest of Ethiopia in 1935-6 and Germany's genocidal rule in Eastern Europe during the Second World War. So the ultimate aim of colonization was now understood in the post-war world to be the education and development of colonial societies to a point where they could rule themselves. And in pursuit of this aim, new indigenous elites were encouraged to seek education in France or Britain or Holland or wherever in Europe, in the new schools, or in the new schools and universities founded in many of the colonies in the interwar years. And these new elites took the lead in campaigning for self-rule and independence, encouraged by the Japanese demonstration during the war that European rule could be overthrown and the hostility shown towards it by the USA and USSR in the Cold War. As nationalist and independence movements gathered strength, European powers proved increasingly unable and increasingly gradually unwilling to suppress them. The use of force to do so very widespread in the final phase of empire ran into serious political difficulties at home, illustrated most dramatically by the Suez Crisis. And to some extent, there's a domino effect. Each single act of colonization and decolonization encouraged nationalist movements in other colonies to push harder for independence and made it more difficult for colonial powers to resist it. And again, uh, these nationalist movements gained support as increased European exploitation of the colonies after 1945, combined with the very obvious growing prosperity of European societies in the post-war boom to fuel popular resentment in the colonies across the globe, linked by the rapid spread of modern mass communications. And under all of these influences, <coughs> decolonization happened in the end much faster than anyone in Europe had imagined. Precisely because it was precipitate and unplanned, it left many problems unsolved and was frequently accompanied or followed by bloodshed or civil uh, unrest uh, or ethnic and religious conflict. Here's some trouble spots in this French map. Decolonization brought to an end a world order centered on Europe and on the European belief and a cultural, to a degree also a racial hierarchy in which Europe and North America were progressive uh, and superior and the rest of the world backward and uh, inferior. The language of superiority lost its legitimacy. A new informal American empire emerged from post-war economic supremacy of the Americans based on command of the seas with strategic <coughs> bases across the globe. And its rhetoric was very different from that of the old empires. It proclaimed the virtues of democracy and freedom, while silently, uh, where it thought it necessary, subordinating them to anti-communist political stability under dictatorships, particularly in South America, where the new capitalist order seemed threatened. In that sense, perhaps the age of empire isn't over yet. Well, what is the legacy of the European empires? It's been argued, particularly by Neil Ferguson, that their legacy, particularly the British Empire's legacy, it's been overwhelmingly positive, spreading the benefits of the rule of law, responsible and incorruptible administration, democratic parliamentary politics, modern and effective science and medicine, dedicated work ethic, respect for private property, and a free enterprise economy across the globe. Certainly these are ideals that have spread across the globe uh, from Europe. But in many ways, uh, the, this legacy has been far from universal. Corruption is widespread in many administrative and political systems, from Kenya to Kazakhstan, uh, as the annual uh, Corruption Perception Index indicates. The rule of law is flouted in many post-colonial states. The benefits of modern science and medicine still have to reach many parts of the globe. While they've improved almost everywhere, death rates are still notably high in former colonized parts of the world. Dictatorships rule a whole swathe of former colonial states, so the concepts of freedom and unfreedom are obviously relative. Once again, a global map of free and unfree legal and political systems shows up a lot of post-colonial states uh, in the unfree camp. Property rights are violated or not respected in most of these. The most obvious negative legacy of empire has been the outbreak of violent and often intractable conflicts 
sometimes based on ethnic and religious hostilities between peoples lumped together in arbitrarily configured political units containing a variety of different religious ethnic groups with little in common. Nigeria, for example, convulsed by a violent civil war and continuing religious conflict, or the Congo or Somalia, where the state's not been able to establish control. Violence has continued with loss of life running into the millions. Or in Sudan, Uganda, or Cambodia, or Kashmir, and what's now Bangladesh, which gained its independence in a violent conflict with Pakistan, or the Middle East with repeated Arab-Israeli wars. States as far apart as Uganda and Fiji have seen violent ethnic conflict erupt with growing tensions between indigenous peoples and the descendants of imported Indian uh, indentured laborers. And to a degree, too, the violence used by the imperial powers in trying to impose their will from the start of empire to the end provided an unfortunate example to follow, uh, as for example here in the, in the Congo. And these violent clashes, like the genocidal civil war in Rwanda, were the product of empire and its legacy. In many colonial, post-colonial states, the political culture of democracy has been thinly rooted. The army, with officers usually trained by the colonial powers themselves, has been virtually the only nationwide institution with the power to enforce its will. So military coups have been commonplace, the slide into dictatorship widespread. <clears throat> the army officer, Jean Bédel Bocassa, who ruled the former French colony of the Central African Republic, from his coup d'etat in 1966 to his overthrow by a military expedition the French government sent in 1979, continued intervention there, declared himself emperor in 1977, and spent a third of his country's income on a lavish coronation ceremony. His contemporary, the Uganda dictator Idi Amin, awarded himself the CBE, conqueror of the British Empire, and married as his fifth wife a go-go dancer for the Ugandan Army's revolutionary suicide mechanized regiment band. They've, uh, however murderous, they seem absurd, but European laughter may be in a nervous displacement of the recognition that their brutal and murderous regimes are based not least on obsession with European models and modes of behavior. So European domination in the 19th century rested above all the power of industry, which gave Europeans the ability to roam the world with steamships and railways, carrying their armies and exports across the globe, suppressing attempts at resistance. The huge revenues generated by industry gave them the financial clout to sustain this huge global effort. Empire took many forms, from mass European settlement to mere occupation of coastal trading bases, uh, the, uh, from the uh, takeover of pre-existing imperial structures, uh, collaboration with existing elites, to direct rule. Um, two world wars in the 20th century, the rise of the USA, undermined the superiority generated during the Napoleonic Wars that gave Europe its edge. What we have now is not so much imperialism as globalization. The diffusion across the globe of what were originally uh, European technologies and cultural practices, European political systems, ideologies, European economic structures and processes. But globalization uh, is we're homogenizing the globe in these areas, even if the process is uneven, will for a long time be incomplete. Increasingly, global uh, major companies and enterprises are global rather than being based in a single country or region, as, uh, as in this map. In the end, there's no common agreement really on how the new global order will be structured. The rationalism of the European Enlightenment has not triumphed. History has not come to a full stop that Francis Fukuyama thought it had 20 years ago. On the contrary, religion, for example, is more than ever a force to be recognized with, from the Islamic republics of the Middle East to the voters of the Republican Party in America, as we've seen in the primary elections. Free trade has not brought uniform benefits across the world. Development has been uneven. Some former colonies have failed to improve economically or descended into chaos and dictatorship. The legacy of empires is as diverse as empire itself. And one of the arguments in this lecture is the very different kinds of empire and pure experience have been. Even in the age of globalization, there seems to be no single agreed set of criteria by which modernity is defined. It looks very different in China to what it seems in Iran, different in America from Tanzania. But one thing is certain, I think, and that's the idea of empire for all the pleading of those who, like Neil Ferguson, have been urging the United States to recognize it has an empire and behave accordingly, the idea of empire has, I think, been discredited, probably for good. And I hope in these lectures I've been able to give you some idea of how this idea originated, how it was put into practice, and how it declined and, and fell. I'm happy to say that uh, Gresham College has renewed my professorship for another year, so my next series of lectures, next winter, will be devoted to what is, in a way, another aspect of globalization, namely,
the spread of epidemic diseases and plagues across the globe, from the bubonic plague to HIV AIDS, their impact and the ways in which human society has sought to prevent or combat them when they've occurred. So I look forward to seeing you next September. In the meantime, wish you all a very pleasant and healthy spring and summer. Thank you very much. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.